morning. Okay. Well, the first document that I uh, read over was the Certificate of Conferral and Positions of the Attorney. Now, this is where the defendant, Ammon Bundy, and his attorney are arguing uh, for the documents, the testimony, the eyewitnesses um, that are going to testify in the case. He doesn't want uh, these things to be done in secret. The government is asked for uh, what is the terminology they use? Blanket protective order. And it, within this document, it states um, Ammon's lawyer is arguing that the Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 16B1 provides that at any time, the court may, for good cause, deny, restrict, or defer discovery or inspection or grant other appropriate relief. Yet, with regards to the present circumstances, the government did not demonstrate good cause to issue a blanket protective order. And his argument is very compelling, and I have to say that it appears to me um, that the federal government doesn't want uh, the public getting a hold of actually what's going on in the case. You know, prior to um, these documents and everything being filed, we have seen uh, we have seen government officials, you know, uh, the sheriff, the FBI, they've all come out, given their story, they've released documents, they've released the tasty footage of the boy shooting, and has left everybody to figure out, you know, exactly what happened there. When we know they have technology today, um, they have got clear um, footage of that event. And uh, they've come out and said that the shooting was justified. Uh, you know, they pled their case to the public, and the mainstream media has helped them. However, uh, mainstream media personality, P. Santilli, well, he's locked up with them, so he's not reporting on this stuff. And the bits and pieces of information we do get, like myself, I rely on Ammon Bundy's lawyer to let me know what's going on. And uh, because I contributed financially to his case, they send me email updates with links in it to court documents and stuff like that that they file so I can stay up to date. Because the mainstream media is not going to tell us what's going on. Well, this is what's going on. The government uh, wants discovery to be done in secret. They don't want the public getting a hold of the information. So in the in his uh, in Ammon Lawyer's attorney's argument, he says in exercising discretion, the commentary for the federal rule provides that the court should consider the safety of witnesses and others, a particular danger of perjury or witness intimidation the protection of information vital to the national security, and the protection of business enterprises from economic reprisal. Even here, good cause is only established on showing that disclosure will work a clearly defined and serious injury. The injury must, show, must be shown with specificity. And he cites the case United States versus Wedge, W-E-C-H-T, um, Third Circuit Court in 2017. Um, he says the broad allegations of harm unsubstantiated by specific examples or articulated reasoning do not support good cause. And he's quoting the Van V. Pansy, P A N S Y, versus Borough of Strasbourg case, which was in the Third Circuit Court in 1994. He says, even if harm would be substantiated by government, by, excuse me, 
Even if harm would be sustained by the government if a protective order was not issued, that harm must be balanced against the public's interest in information, as well as any prejudice that would be, would be suffered by the defendant should the protective order be issued. He said the balance should be in favor of disclosure. Um, and he goes on to point out what the government has um, claimed in order to get this blanket secrecy. In his motion, the government cites that sensitive discovery involved in this case, as well as potential for witness intimidation. The government further elaborates that the sensitivity discovery includes law enforcement reports and interviews, analysis of evidence, and copies of seized physical evidence, all seemingly commonplace in categories of discovery in a criminal case. The government also submitted an affidavit by Special Agent Catherine Armstrong in support of this motion. Almost all the government's arguments are based upon impermissible generalities. One of the only specific and articulated examples is Special Agent Armstrong's reference to an alleged but unestablished instance where a woman reports having been intimidated at a Safeway store in Burns, Oregon. And that's found on uh, the affidavit, page 3. She also cites a similar unestablished instance where the parents of a Harney County law enforcement official felt harassed. Not that they did harass her, she just felt that way. Even assuming that these examples are true, which they're not, they're not true, guys. It stands to reason that in a free and crowded society, sometimes people's feelings may be hurt and they may feel harassed. Further, these events have nothing to do with the result of making discovery materials public, nor with any certainty to these defendants. Making these people feel comfortable in a crowded and free society should not be this court's business when no actual and credible threat of violence has been proffered, particularly when weighed against the defendant's need for crowdsourcing as set forth in the Declaration of Counsel. What is the clearly defined and serious injury? None. Further, these kinds of examples are not supported by the articulated reasoning requirement as the kinds of instances that would be at issue in the Ninth Circuit to prevent access to unfiled discovery material, a party asserting good cause bears the burden for each particular document it seeks to protect of showing that specific prejudice or harm will result if no protective order is granted. And that's in the Bolts case, F-O-L-T-Z. Like other circuits, broad allegations of harm and examples that are, some, that are not supported by articulated reasoning do not satisfy the Rule 26B test. Uh, Beckman Industry Incorporated versus International Insurance Company, Ninth Circuit, 1992. <clears throat> and regarding the specifics identified in hearing before this court, once discovery was actually able to be quoted in open court instead of summarized by government witnesses, both of those instances were either debunked or shown to be mischaracterized by the government. No surprise there, huh, guys? A witness who claims to feel intimidated and incorrectly identifies the person who intimidates her to be one of the co-defendants in this case is not good cause for a blanket protective order with thousands of pages of discovery that have been provided to date. With the respect to the second incident about uh, the alleged witness harassment, the discovery actually paints a different picture that then uh, Special Agent Armstrong hopes to convey to the court. The discovery in the case actually showed that law enforcement official Sheriff David Ward wrote emails to FBI that discussed threats his parents made to co-defendants in the case, not the other way around. In fact, one of the co-defendants in this case was handing out flyers exercising his right to free speech and made a comment about forcing the sheriff to do his job. The sheriff's parents commented back 
at the injury a type of gun could cause to someone and about what would happen if one hair on the sheriff's head was harmed. Since that information was disclosed in open court, defense counsel is unaware of any actual threat or intimidation that were made to the parents of the sheriff. If the government's hypothesis has been tested with release of the information and is proof of the lack of need for a blanket order. Special Agent Armstrong also pointed to a statement by an environmentalist who reportedly traveled to the refuge every day for 10 days. That environmentalist stated that his life was threatened, although Special Agent Armstrong does not say by who, a co-defendant in this case or not. <clears throat> However, this environmentalist allegedly left the refuge after one of his colleagues was accused of being an undercover FBI agent. There seem to be two equally likely possibilities that explain these allegations of harassment, which means that the government has not yet met its burden. One, the remark by the government is purely speculative. Or two, super sensitive, thin skinned people may claim a threat or intimidation when it is just words that make them feel uncomfortable. In reality, neither of these scenarios have anything to do with threats of physical force. And this goes back to this political correctness thing, you know. Be careful what you say, it may hurt someone's feelings. And we know that um, when the environmentalist, if that's what you want to call them, uh, we know when Pete Santilli ousted that FBI agent guy, that his friend jumped in and said, Oh, he put his, his life in harm, and that, no, he wasn't. Nobody threatened him, and nobody wanted him off the property or asked him to leave. And if you actually go back and listen to the video, this guy was actually um, accusing Pete Santilli of being an FBI agent. He said, oh, well, I've heard on the Internet, and, you know, that you're an FBI agent. And he's smiling while he's goading Pete into an argument, and and Pete lashes back, you know, hey, bud, you know, here's pictures of you, here's a video of you, is this you or not? And this is what got them uncomfortable, but no one threatened them, and we all saw that. But in a statement, um, Ammon Bundy's lawyer quotes Justice Potter Stewart uh, defending the words of other people. He says, a function of free speech under our system of government is to invite dispute. It may indeed best serve its high purpose when it induces a condition of unrest, creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, or even stirs people to anger. Speech is often provocative and challenging. It may strike at prejudices and preconceptions and have profound unsettling effects as it presses for acceptance of an idea. This is why freedom of speech is protected against censorship or punishment, and less shown likely to produce a clear and present danger of serious substantive evil that rises far above public inconvenience, annoyance, or unrest. There is no room under the Constitution for a more restrictive view. And that's in Edwards v. South Carolina, a 1963 case. With respect to witness intimidation or harassment, our crowdsourcing efforts allow us to discover that at least one critical witness statement disclosed in discovery by the government is claimed by that same witness to be an inaccurate, to be inaccurate or false. Ammon Bundy cannot disclose that witness statement right now as this person fears retaliation by the government. That's the problem and reason why our society and our justice system favors the freedom to disclose and disseminate information. The government has already had the benefit of its communication. Part of the benefit of discovery is to ensure that such a benefit is fair and balanced, and it is the public who can help do that more than anything. So consider that the only accusation of witness intimidation that Ammon's legal team has uncovered so far has been on the part of the government through the FBI. Without crowdsourcing efforts, this inaccurate witness statement would likely have stood uncontroverted as a part of the government's attempt 
attempted characterization and false branding of his protesters as violent and threatening individuals. This taint is impermissible, and it will affect trial witnesses as well as potential jurors. The court can help dissipate such taint by refusing to keep in place any overly broad restrictions on the free flow of essential information in the discovery material. So this, uh, so this statement to <clears throat> is 16 pages long, guys. But there's a lot of good information. It's a really good argument. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm really sick and tired of secrets too. And and Andy Ammon Bundy doesn't believe in them either. So his attorney is fighting to keep the discovery uh, open to the public. Um, I'll follow up with more updates later. Thanks.